Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Once again, thank you for joining us today on the program. Uh, I trust that you are being blessed by the Word of God that's flowing from this ministry. Uh, we have certainly appreciated the letters and the uh, emails and the uh, calls that you've made to the ministry. It really, really encourages us. Uh, if you are enjoying what we're saying, please take a moment to sit down and write. If you, those of you who've already written to us or called us, you realize that we're not just trying to collect your information so we can barrage you with a, uh, a whole bunch of campaigns. We just don't do that. Uh, but we do need to know if you're enjoying this and uh, if you want us to continue teaching along this subject. We are going to come to a short uh, break in our filming and uh, I'm going to pay very careful attention to the response we get from this as to whether we continue teaching from Revelation or we move on to another subject. So if you're being blessed by this, take a moment to uh, write to us, uh, call the number on the screen, go to our website or our Facebook public profile page and let us know you're watching, that you're listening, and that you're enjoying the program. Uh, let me also say that if you missed anything, because we've been teaching this now for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, if you missed anything, you can go back uh, to my website or just to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Everything we have aired to, the, to date is available, and you can go back and watch it. Or even if you see something today and you thought, boy, I wish I could go back and watch that again, it is on YouTube. You can go back and watch it. You can pause it, watch it over and over and over again. So you can go back to our YouTube page and get what we've said up to this point because we are building and we are probably taking the book of Revelation maybe perhaps from a different viewpoint than you've ever heard it before. Let me say that we are not trying to be in opposition with anybody else. We're not trying to uh, fight anybody else's doctrine. We simply, because you know, some of these subjects, eschatology, end time things are very, very touchy to a lot of people. So, uh, you know, if you don't like what we're saying about this, don't just cut us off because that's our view of eschatology. Uh, you know, follow some of the other things we do. Eat the grapes, spit out the seeds. We are totally comfortable with that when folks don't embrace every idea that we have. We don't embrace every idea we've ever heard, and so you're, we want you to be comfortable about that. But we do want you to prayerfully consider the things that the Lord is saying to us, and I believe it's so powerfully positive, flowing from the book of Revelation. Uh, once again, you can go back and, and uh, see some of those things that we have aired to bring you up to date, because we're going to start today again in the fourth chapter. Last week we introduced this and did a, a review of uh, how we are transitioning from uh, an old covenant mindset. See, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation were written to seven churches that were really in Asia. Now, even though it was written uh, to them, uh, we can certainly glean things that is applicable to our lives today, but we need to understand the reality uh, that this was written to the first century church that were in one of the greatest paradigm shifts of human history. And once again, the message to these seven churches is the message to repent, which is the Greek word metanoia. These churches were in the greatest shift of changing the way they think because the paradigm that they were shifting from was from an old covenant mindset to a new covenant mindset. And we shared some of that last week as we talked about how each one of these churches, the message to the church at Ephesus was you need to move away from works and labor. That's an old covenant concept. We talked about... Uh, the church at Smyrna moving away from suffering because that was an old covenant concept. We talked about uh, the church at I believe it was uh, I believe it was Thyatira uh, when he had a prophet Balaam that was there that was cursing people who were not under a curse. So the shift in their thinking was we need to move away from this we're under a curse mentality. That's an old covenant concept. Uh, we talked about Jezebel and uh, and we talked about uh, you know uh, that that church remembering. Uh, you know, some things. We, we talked about uh, the church at Philadelphia receiving the key of David, which is the right to rule and reign, not just in the future, but with the greater son of David living his life through us as he gives us the abundance of grace we reign in life. So each one of them was talking about a transition. We talked about the Laodicean church, which was the last one that he talks about was lukewarm. It's because it had a mixture of two covenants, old covenant and new covenant. It had cold and hot. It was stuck in the middle. And he says to them, if you overcome, he said to them, behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And uh, to him that overcomes, I'll grant him to sit with me in my throne. Two key words. That's the last church that he speaks to before he comes to the fourth chapter. And there's two key words. If I'm standing at the door, the key word there is door. Uh, I'm knocking. If any man open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. And uh, then he, I'll grant him to sit with me in my throne. So those two key words that connect the third chapter to the fourth chapter, and that's door and throne. I submit to you that when he opens chapter 4, says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was open. It's the same door that was, he was knocking on in two verses above this. I believe the supper that he's inviting them to is a supper that is the, the same one he talked about all through the scriptures. When he says to them, it is, he says to them that a certain man made a great supper and he bade many. And they all would begin to make excuses why they could not come. I submit to you that this supper that he seated us to or invited us to is a supper which is a great feast, a feast of Israel. Not Passover, not Pentecost, but the feast of tabernacles where we can come and sit at his banquet. But he said because he made an invitation to all of these servants and none of them came, he says to those wicked servants, you know what? Uh, you're not invited any longer, but go to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. I submit to you that was the Lord saying to apostate Israel, you're about to miss uh, the invitation to this supper and I'm about to invite some Gentiles in. I don't know about you, but I'm coming to the supper. This is the kingdom of God. It's like a great supper. I'm, I'm responding. I, I mean, I, I believe that the Lord, listen, is giving us through this ministry right now a hand-delivered invitation to come to this supper and to partake of this lamb that's on this table. What's for supper? Lamb. We're going to feed on lamb. We're going to feast on his finished work. We're going to eat the head, the legs, the pertinence thereof. We're going to feast on the good things of the kingdom of God, and we're going to learn how to not just receive the kingdom, but to learn how to dispense it where we're not just kingdom consumers, but kingdom exporters as well. Now this message, then he comes on, let me go further in this particular segment. He said, after this I looked, behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow around the throne, and sat like unto an emerald. And uh, round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw Four and twenty elders sitting, four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now I'm going to I'm, I'm going to not get this far in this segment, but I do want to unpack this this particular uh, this particular uh, part of it. In my notes, what I've done is I, I, I've said in my notes I said the first usage of the word church, which comes from the Greek word ekklesia or ecclesia. This word literally means to be called out, or the called out ones. Now, these called out ones this time, though, were not called out of a physical bondage of Egypt, but they were called out of a spiritual bondage of religion, as well as they were called out of the bondage of sin. Now, both were bondages, but in Revelation chapter 11, I believe it is verse number 8, it says, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now let me tell you that our Lord was not crucified in the physical, literal city of Sodom or Egypt. Our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. You say, well, why is that important? Because the Spirit in Revelation 11 makes a direct connection to Egypt and Sodom and Gomorrah when he says our Lord was crucified in the city, watch this, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So the Lord equates that apostate people and those folks who did not receive their Messiah and that first century 
uh, group of people who had an opportunity over and over and over to come to this supper, to come to the kingdom, to receive the covenants of promise, to receive their king, and to receive their Messiah. But because they rejected it, God said uh, that uh, uh, our Lord was crucified in that city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, so that what the Lord sees the city of Jerusalem that was about to be destroyed in 70 AD is he sees them equivalent to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, what God, uh, what God equates to be just as perverted and bad as what was going on in Sodom and Egypt is the perversion of religion and the perversion of man-made religion and the perversion and the mixture of law and grace. Paul calls it a perversion of the gospel. And he calls that place Sodom. And matter of fact, when Jesus was walking the planet, he said to them, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the miracles that you saw, they would have repented long ago. He said uh, it would be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment that it will be for you. I'm talking to you about what he was saying to those people alive and well in that time slot because the judgment that came in 70 AD where there was literally a fire that fell from heaven and consumed their cities, destroyed until there was not one stone left upon another. It was burnt to the ground. That judgment that came upon Sodom was literally upon Jerusalem within 40 years of Jesus saying that to them. It happened within a generation. And then the second thing he says to them is that I equate this place where our Lord was crucified with Egypt. So all of a sudden, my mind began to make a connection. If the Lord equates the place where our Lord was crucified as spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, then the Egypt that we were being brought out of is not a physical bondage as much as it was a spiritual bondage. I believe that what he was doing was he was about to leave them out of a bondage of law, legalism, man-made traditions, and scribes and Pharisees that had polluted and, and even added things to the law, that they were to the point where God has said, look, I'm going to bring you up out of this slavery, and I'm going to bring you into sonship. Under the law, you were a servant. In the new covenant, you're a son. Uh, we were slaves in Egypt, but now we're the sons of God. And what I began to see was that so many people are still in the bondage of slavery to religion everywhere. I'm going to tell you, I believe somebody's going to get set free watching me today to realize, you know what? One of the things God wants to deliver me from is He wants to deliver me from the bondage of religion. There are people uh, that are getting set free from everything under our ministry, from, uh, from drug abuse, from alcoholism, from uh, demonic activity. We've seen people get delivered of satanic worship, everything. But I'm going to tell you, I believe one of the hardest things to get people delivered from is the bondage of religion. So when I'm telling you, I believe God brought them out, out under the children of Israel. He brought them out by p- telling them to take the blood of a lamb, put it on the doorpost of their houses, and then take that lamb in the house in the night and eat it roast with fire. I'm telling you, God had sent a real lamb to literal Israel in this particular time slot in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he's offering them uh, what's going to get them out of the bondage of Egypt. And he tells them in the book of Exodus, he says, I'm going to bring you out, but if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't follow on with this, all of these plagues are going to come upon you. See, the, the book of Revelation was the fulfillment of God's end of the covenant bargain because they had rejected this lamb who had now been offered uh, to bear our sins so that the wrath of God could be satisfied and appeased. I, I submit to you that the only reason God poured out, listen, I believe that when we come further in this book of Revelation, if we continue the study, you're going to see that the trumpets, the vials, and, and the seals, and all of these catastrophes and judgments that were poured out, were poured out on apostate Israel in 70 AD. Matter of fact, I'm going to jump way ahead of myself, but when there's four living creatures here that have four faces, a man, an ox, an eagle, and let me think of it, it's a, the, the man, a, and a lion. Those four faces, for one thing, speak of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as Jesus is depicted in them as the lion, the man, the eagle, and the ox. That's what it is, the fourth one. It's the four Gospels. And these four Gospels are saying, come and see. These four Gospels are saying, come here and see something. I I submit to you that three of the writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
submit in the Gospels an Olivet Discourse of a coming catastrophe, of a coming judgment, that Jesus sets a time limit of when that would occur. In Matthew 24, 34, he said, this generation right here will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And he talks about wars and famines, delivering you up to be killed. Uh, uh, all of those great tribulations such as was not since the world began or will ever be Again, that's powerfully good news to me. But the thing of it is, Jesus sets a time text there in verse 34 and said, this generation standing right here won't pass until all these things have been fulfilled. Somebody said, well, no, that, that word right there means the race of people who are alive when they see these things. No, 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 that's not what it means. If that's what it means, then that's, that word generation is never used anywhere else in the Scripture to mean a race. It means a generation because the same exact word is used when Jesus is prophesying in Matthew 23, and he's saying to you, why, you scribes and you Pharisees and you hypocrites and you white disciples, he's saying to them, woe unto you, how oft I would have gathered you under my, my feathers. But he says, all of these things will come upon this generation in Matthew chapter 23. So the same generation on the scene then is the same generation that John is talking to, and Jesus is talking to, I'm sorry, in Matthew 24. John is the only apostle who in his account does not give an Olivet Discourse, which is the same as like Matthew 24, where we get a lot of our eschatological ideas from. I submit to you that the book of Revelation is John's view of the Olivet Discourse, because everything that you will see unfold in coming chapters are the wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the persecution, delivering you up to be killed, the sun darkened, the moon turned into blood. Uh, all of those things are, in my opinion, not coming catastrophes. They are what occurred in 70 AD. The temple was destroyed. And if we'll stay in context and read this book uh, in the context of who it was written to, I believe it'll make a whole lot more sense to us because, see, the reason I don't believe, this is going to help somebody today, the reason I don't believe we've got another future somewhere hell on earth coming is because all of these judgments and vows and plagues have already been poured out. And God said these are the last plagues. In them is filled up the wrath of God. Uh, I'm telling you that, uh, I, I, and the only reason it would come to this, this group of people was because God had made a covenant with natural Israel that if you don't do all the words of this law, then all of these plagues will come upon you. God kept his end of the covenant bargain uh, because they forced him to. But at the same time, he looks at them in Matthew 23 and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and you that killed the prophets, how often I would have gathered you under my feathers as a hen doth gather her chicks, but you would not. Therefore, your house is left to you desolate. That prophecy was given to them. And so when I think about how often I would have gathered you under my feathers, I think of the mercy seat. The only place God has feathers uh, is on the mercy seat when the wings of the cherubs would overshadow. What God was simply saying to Israel is, I've done everything I know to do. I've done signs and miracles among you. And if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen it, they'd have repented it long ago. If I, you know, how often I would have gathered you, but you have killed the prophets. You've stoned them that were sent to you. And the blood of all of them that were slain upon the earth, Jesus said in Matthew 23, would come upon that generation because the words of their mouth was, let his blood be on us. That's the reason it happened then and not in our future, because we are not in an old covenant expecting these catastrophes. This ought to be incredibly good news to somebody, is that what we are expecting is the kingdom of God. I believe if we could wake the church up to where we realize we are to be the salt, the light, and the leaven in the earth, we would see the kingdom of God just like these churches if they repented. He said, I'll give you the right to sit with me in my throne because I believe with everything that's in me, folks, that we have the right to rule and reign in this planet. I believe that with everything that's in me. Somebody wrote a blog about me not too long ago, and I think they thought they were insulting me. This guy wrote, writes in this blog and said, this guy actually believes the gospel will work. I'm like, I do believe the gospel will work. Uh, he, he wrote, this guy actually believes 
He's the temple of the Holy Ghost. I thought, well, he, he did read my stuff. He's exactly right. That is what I believe. I do believe we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. I believe God lives inside of us. I believe the Holy Ghost is powerful. I believe in the authority of the believer. I believe that God gave us this authority, not so that somewhere out in the future when some real catastrophe hits, uh, we, we escape it all. I believe that, first of all, those catastrophes are not in our future. They're in our past. But nevertheless, this dominion mandate, this authority of the believer is not just for us to live uh, right now until something big hits. It's to change the situations that are around us. Think with me for a moment. If we could get the whole church to wake up and realize that this fourth chapter of Revelation and this command and call to come up hither is not a geographical location, but it's a call of God to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and to the place of authority and dominion where the church belongs, I believe we could turn the world upside down. I really believe that with everything that's in me. I believe that's the reason God is giving us the platform He's giving us is to awaken this church and say, you know what? The Holy Ghost is to do more than talk in tongues. The Holy Ghost is the power of God. It is the it is when when Jesus gave the mandate, He said, "Go to all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils." I believe there are people that are going to grab that and grasp that and realize that this call once again is not just to some geographical location. When He says, "Come up hither," He's talking about you're going to come up to another dimension. You're moving out of law into grace. You're moving out of the old covenant into the kingdom for such a time as this. And I might just you know in in my uh, notes what I did was. I also put, uh, let me just read a few things. It said, there was a voice like a trumpet that sounded. Please note that this is not a fat baby with wings that steps out on uh, a cloud one day, it, but it's a prophetic declaration giving a certain sound. For if the trumpet, it's a voice that sounds like a trumpet that gives a certain sound so that we can prepare to the battle. It says, please note that this is not the seventh trumpet which was later found in the book of Revelation, which deals with, you know, at the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise. This is not the last trump. This is the first time a trumpet is mentioned, as a matter of fact. So this is not the last trump. This trumpet, however, is calling you up higher for the message is to come up hither, not to some geographical location, but to a position of rulership. We must learn to discern what the trumpets are saying. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And then the, I, yesterday when I was studying this, I went back to the book of, of, of uh, Numbers, and there's a lot of stuff on trumpets. But in the book of Numbers, it tells us that, uh, uh, Numbers chapter 10, that there are several purposes that are given for the sounding of the trumpets. And I, I think what I'll do is I'll just turn back there and read a verse or so of this, if I can uh, find it real quickly here. Uh, but in, in Numbers chapter uh, Numbers chapter 10, I believe it is verse 1, it said, The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeyings of the camp. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to the door uh, uh, to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When you blow an alarm, then the camp that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are, lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but you shall not sound an alarm. And, and the sons of Aaron the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall go. They shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God. You shall be saved from your enemies. That's powerful. Also in the day of your gladness, in the solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, shall you blow with trumpets over your burnt offerings and over your sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before God. I am the Lord your God. And so what I want you to see is that the purpose of the trumpets, several things you need to look at throughout the Word. See, when we get to the book of Revelation, everything in the book of Revelation is already in the Scriptures. We try to get something from USA Today or from CNN, but the Bible will interpret itself. When you see candlesticks in Revelation, there's candlesticks in the tabernacle of Moses. When you see incense, they're in the tabernacles. You go back and you see what they mean, but they're also trumpets. When you see silver trumpets, silver is a, is a metal that denotes uh, redemption. When you see brass, it is a, is a metal that denotes uh, judgment or, or uh, catastrophe. These are silver trumpets. But when these silver trumpets sounded, there were several things. 
And I'm just going to list them for you as to what they were, that what they were used for. The first one was to call an assembly. The second usage was for the journey of the camp, and God is telling them it's time to move forward. Uh, the third one was to blow an alarm, uh, to sound an alarm, and to, uh, to warn them. The fourth one was to gather the princes or the leaders. The fifth one was when it was time to go to war, and then God said, if I blow the trumpet of war, then you will be remembered before the Lord, and you will be delivered from your enemies. Uh, then the sixth one was to pronounce celebrations, feast days, days of gladness, and solemn days. And then the seventh one was to blow over the burnt sacrifices and peace offerings. In the Jewish mind, the sounding of a trumpet was not for evacuation purposes. It was uh, one of the above. When Jericho was taken in Joshua chapter 6, seven trumpets blew, and the shout was the response of the trumpets, and the walls fell, and the promised land was taken. I submit to you that's the kind of a trumpet that was sounding here, is there are trumpets that are about to be sounded, and these trumpets are saying it's time to shout and take the dominion of the promised land. When they heard the sound of the trumpet in, in, uh, in the book of Joshua and Jericho was about to fall, let me tell you, it wasn't a bad sound. When they heard that seventh trumpet sound, there was a shout came up from inside of them that said, God has given us the city and we're going to enter into the city. Let me tell you, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the promised land is more than just a piece of real estate. It is rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we can enter into that promised land right now. There are trumpets sounding, and we are about to move into our rulership. If you can hear the trumpets sounding, come up hither. There is a door that's being opened in the realm of spirit to the church right now that I believe is going to turn the world upside down. Can you hear the trumpet sounding? Come up hither. Come up higher. We're out of time. Wow. Uh, take a moment to call that number on the screen. Please uh, get behind what we're doing. If you believe in what we're doing, don't just sit there and watch and not be a part. Don't be on the sidelines. Help us take the gospel around the world. We need your help. Call that number on the screen or go to our website and give sow a seed uh, via your credit card or however you want to. We bless you. Tune in again next week. Tell your friends about us. God bless you is our prayer. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ. 